Hello, everyone, and welcome to the SciPy 2019 Lightning Talks. Hello. First session. Hello. That's, that's an, an appropriately sort of low energy, yeah. slight enthusiasm. Woo! Yeah. Yeah, there, there you go, go, Matthias. Anyone else? No, just OK. That's yeah. fine. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Can someone see Eric out of the balloon? <laughs> um, so if you're not familiar with the lightning talks, we, they're very short, brief talks that get cut off at some point. By We're, us. By us. Um, there were sign-up sheets downstairs. Wait, who are we, Anthony? Who, we, we, who are we, we, Paul? You've been doing this so long, you've I forgotten I, to I, even I don't even respond to that name so anymore. So usually what you do is you start at the beginning, Anthony, and then when you come to the end, you stop. Okay. I th and, should and, I take and, notes? And so you, you could, yeah, but you're, you're, you're missing that first part where you start at the beginning. Okay. Um, can we go back? Yeah. I think right. Let's just rewind. Pretend this never happened. Hey, how is everybody sci-fi doing? <laughs> Woo! Good. There we go. Hey, wow. What an enthusiastic crowd. It's almost like we didn't coach them one bit. I know. Uh, I'm Anthony Skopatz. I'm Paul Ivanov. And uh, these are the SciPy Lightning Talks. So we'll be uh, doing a, a brief set, uh, or a long set of brief talks. We've got 40 people already signed up. That's so a lot. So that's a lot. And so we're changing the format slightly. We're changing the format slightly, indeed. In a, in a couple of different ways, so, so be prepared. So the it, first change is that we now ask that your talks are three minutes <laughs> instead of five. Because we want to see your talks. So be all prepared talks, to talk very, very quickly, unlike what I am doing right now. Um, and then we have some other things that we're going to do tomorrow. So That's right. Yeah. And so th what those other things are, and as I describe them, I want to call uh, Paul Anzel up to the stage. He'll be the first speaking, so you can start setting up. Thank you, Paul. As well Good as name. we'll have... Uh, Kyle Niemeyer and Tim Swift on deck. So we're gonna, because the talks are so short, we're gonna have two of you come up and sit uh, uh, next to the stage here. So, so as Anthony was saying, we we've been doing this for a little while. I think this is our third year co-hosting. It's true. It's turns out it's Anthony's tenth year hosting the Lightning Talks. So a decade of Lightning Talks. I know. It's shameful, really. Yeah. It's shameful. Yeah. So they're getting faster just now. It took, it took us 10 years to go from five minutes to three minutes. So we'll see how it goes. But the new thing that we want to do is I don't want us to be doing this until our beards are gray or until we're, you know, we're rolling up here in our wheelchairs and trying to still crack the same old sci-fi puns. We want to hear your puns. And so that's Ooh. the new thing that we're doing is that, ah. it, okay. It's okay. Everyone's worried. Everyone's heart rates just went up in the room. Everyone's like, what? <laughs> this, is, this could go so horribly wrong. And it can. But we're going we're gonna to work with it. What we're going to do is we're going to not start today so that you all have a good night's rest to, to think up of all your cleverest scientifically related puns. And uh, for those that wish to participate in this, just let me or Anthony know after the session today or come to the beginning of the lightning talks tomorrow and sit at one of these two tables, okay? And what we'll have is the opportunity for the mic to be available if in immediately after Paul's talk or somebody else's talk, if you have something related that you want to pun about, you'll just raise your, your you know, you'll indicate that, signal it to us and we'll hand you a mic. Raise your eyebrows. You'll, you'll, you'll get to say your funny thing and then everyone will laugh and it'll be great. But and that is how we can progress to just more than Anthony and I trying to do this thing. Right. It'll be a constitutional monarchy rather than the, a, the, yeah, that's, that's right. a divine right of kings or something. That's right. Um, all Strange right. Strange women lining ponds. Yeah, I, it's the first thing that sprung to mind, unfortunately. <laughs> um, with that, I think uh, we'll hand it off to Paul. So thank you very much. All right. Whoa, that's loud. Welcome, Paul. Well, you say that these talks are blue shifting. All right, three minutes, let's go. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Paul Anzell. My photo's not showing in the slide. OK. A um, little bit of introduction about myself. Uh, I was a grad student in applied physics uh, a few years ago. I ended up running screaming from grad school to go to industry. And it turned out great. Um, I've been there for a few years. 
anybody who's looking to make a similar transition going from academia to industry, I'd like to give just some brief points of advice uh, to help you make the transition. Oh, slide shut up. Um, just kind of introducing the general process of how an interview goes. You submit your resume, there's some processes here. You get to meet me during the on-site technical interview. Hi, I'm your technical interviewer. And hopefully you end up with an offer. Uh, on the route though, please don't make these mistakes. I have made these mistakes. First thing, it's really important to, to try and network, to try and meet people. Um, con congratulations for making it out here. I encourage you to meet all the people you can, go to every social event you can. Most job events are not posted. A lot of job events, it happens, or job offers happen because you happen to know somebody or you happen to ask, hey, I'm looking around, do you happen to have any advice? Um, I personally hate glad handing and cold calling people on LinkedIn. I think it's really weird. But if you have hobbies, if you have interesting projects where you're just going out there and introducing yourself, that works. You just need to find ways to kind of get your name out there. Once people know who you are, you need to ask for referrals. Referrals really help you. Um, they can let you skip, skip the first couple steps of the process, which really helps. Um, it's somebody vouching for you that somebody can often get a bonus, so they'll like to do it. A very helpful thing to do, and I have made this mistake, the referrer generally needs to be the person submitting your resume for the job ID. So you can't just submit a job ID and hope eventually you can say, oh, I know so and so. They need to put in your, your job application. Number three, automated job screening systems are not very smart. Sometimes technical rec recruiters aren't either. I, job number two when I applied, uh, I was almost rejected because I didn't have machine learning knowledge. Never mind that I said, lots of experience with regression and classification. I didn't explicitly have the words machine learning on there. And thankfully I knew somebody at the company who could say, try again, put the words machine learning on your resume, you'll be good. I'm almost out of time. Um, just be careful with that thing. Number four, um, you're good here at SciPy, should be in good shape. SQL and version control are pretty essential things to know as well. Um, I'd highly recommend software carpentry as kind of minimum viable knowledge. Number five. And thank you, Paul. Worry about every job item. Woo! Have a good portfolio. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. Well done. Up next is Kyle, and if Nick's, so for uh, Nick could come up on be on deck yeah that'd be great uh, so Paul uh, is turns out I think this is the peak Paul for SciPy because we have at least five Pauls uh, I checked the slack there's mm -hmm. five Pauls it's still way fewer than mats I think there's about 18 or 20 mats yeah. so maybe you, you could find your own conference like Katie Conf has been, succeeded in that yeah. perhaps it's consider true. it consider it cool. but there, there are also two Matt Davises at this conference so one Kyle Niemeyer, I assume. Um, so my name is Kyle. Um, I'm here to talk real quick about something you may or may not have heard of, um, the US Research Software Sustainability Institute, or URSI. Um, I wouldn't think about the acronym too long because there's actually an S in the US that's kind of just absorbed in there. Um, so we're plan So if you haven't heard of URSI, I'll talk about it in just a sec. I will say that I am not a principal investigator on this project, although the other people working with me on the summer school, quote summer school, Jeff and Karthik are. There are some other PIs. Um, I don't think any of whom are here, Dan Katz, Nick Weber, and uh, Sandra Gazing. Okay, so the URSI's mission, um, we're, this is a, we're in currently a planning phase right now, and the mission of URSI is to, is to be an institute in the United States um, with a goal of, a uh, mission of improving the quality, usefulness, and sustainability of research software by improving practices and increasing diversity of practitioners. Um, this is a pretty big effort. Um, it's in the planning phase. It doesn't, exa it doesn't actually exist yet, but we're starting to do some of the activities as a demonstration of what it might do were it to be funded by somebody like the National Science Foundation. So the thing that I'm going to talk specifically is on the training side right now and in a, in a pilot initiative we're planning for, for later this year. Um, so some of you may notice in, in the research software engineering world, there's a pretty big gap between what we train people for, which is frequently domain science, basics of programming, and then what we expect of them, which is to develop you know, useful, sustainable, very well developed research software. And there's not a lot of training in between. You can just kind of figure it out as you go. 
Um, so I'm going to do a live demo real quick, just based on raise of hands. How many of you in the room write research software? Awesome. A lot of people. How many of you were trained to do specifically this? <laughs> yeah, okay. So there's maybe like three people with their hands up. Um, I also would not have put my hand up for the second one there. So we kind of figure it out as we go. So there's a big gap in terms of, of um, training software engineering um, for researchers. We just don't, we don't get that kind of training. So that's where our, and we have some things. There's a, there's a, a landscape of training that's out there. Um, based either, you know, depending on the level of pedagogy or whether it's project-based learning, we have things like software carpentry and data carpentry, which t teaches the basics. Um, we have things like workshops and, and the very lo low left corner si traditional scientific meetings where you don't really learn much of how to do this at all. Um, there are some um, more project-based things like sprints, unconferences, things like hack weeks. And um, what we're trying to do is, is bring something that has a lot of pedagogy but also is very project-based uh, in the form of a summer school. Um, so we're piloting such a summer school. If ERSI was funded, then we would be doing this permanently every summer, bringing in what, uh, quite a few people for about a week. Um, that doesn't exist yet, so we're going to do a pilot talking about having students go through topics like design, modularity, um, collaborative software development, testing, peer code review, packaging, documentation, licensing, and so on. All very hands-on. The students would learn and then, and then do this. So I will say that it's, it's, quote, summer school because it's happening in December for two and a half days in Seattle. Um, it's aimed at early career researchers who have the software carpentry basics but don't know how to develop software. It's and free. And thank you, Kyle. Thank you. Please apply. <laughs> All right. So, so, sounds like Ursi's mission is dirt simple. <laughs> Ursi? It's Ursi? No? Oh, come on. It's a canonical joke there. <laughs> thank you. Um, up next on deck is Kim Peavy. If you could come up. And Go ahead, uh, no, up you're, on the, you're on stage. So. Keep seeing that owl image. What a hoot. Ah, okay, that's, that's good. All right. Um, also, that, it's, it's still summer in the southern hemisphere in December. That's fine. It's just because you're doing it in the northern hemisphere. <laughs> cool. Um, so I'm Tim Swast. I work for Google, and I just wanted to talk about um, a problem I had recently, which is how to go from a certain kind of bytes into a pandas data frame as fast as I could. Um, so the problem was uh, BigQuery uh, recently started sending Avro bytes over the wire, and uh, I was using fast Avro because it is the, the fastest one to parse those, but it wasn't quite true to its name in, in my case. So to take 150 megabytes of Avro bytes and turn it into a data frame, it took over a minute. Um, compare that to Java or uh, Go, it took maybe 12 seconds, uh, including the download time. Um, part of that was my fault, because I was looping over eat all of the rows in Python code, but part of it was, you know, fast Avro wasn't optimized for this use case. Um, so I, I was looking around, how do you make uh, Avro parsing fast? Surely people have solved this problem. And I got this blog post that kind of had a crazy suggestion, which is Avro files come with a schema header. Um, so you, the first part of an Avro file says, OK, here's what all the rows uh, will look like after this. Um, and so what this, uh, this company did, RTB House, is uh, at first they were manually writing uh, code, Java code, to parse the Avro files that were in their data pipeline. And then they realized, well, you know, Java has a JIT compiler, you know, we're running on the JVM, how about we generate this code uh, based on the Avro schema instead of having our engineers uh, write it out? Um, so that was kind of a fun idea, but uh, I'm using Python, and Python is not jitted unless you're using PyPy, which, which I'm not. Um, but uh, with luck, I found uh, Numba. Um, and Numba works really, really well. So basically, you write your function in pure Python uh, with a few caveats if you want to use this no Python mode. Um, and you add a decorator to it, and it uses LLVM to kind of compile it down to machine code. Um, and I've used Cython a little bit. And honestly, Numba is so much more fun than <laughs> using Cython. Um, there's no build steps. It's just Python code. It, it's really great. 
Um, so I did this. Uh, I actually uh, manually wrote a parser just like uh, those folks at RTB House did just to see, okay, for this specific table, can I make it fast? And then um, it was fast. <laughs> so I, I parsed that same table that was taking 75 seconds in about five seconds. Um, so that, that made me happy. Um, that, that's about it. All right, thank you. So that, that when you make things go really fast, uh, you did some avracadabra. <laughs> Matt, no? Okay. That was a very mean joke. Sorry. Sorry. Um, it's just your normal mode. Nah. Uh, uh, up next is Ivan on, uh, on deck here. And uh, at the podium right now, we have Nick. If you're trying to make something go fast and you think you might not be the only one, just take a number. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, can people see my screen here? So I'm going to talk to you about uh, Napari. It's uh, um, a, a multi-dimensional image viewer for Python. And um, uh, oops, sorry, slides. Um, it's uh, designed for kind of browsing, annotating, um, and analyzing large uh, multi-dimensional images. Uh, it's uh, built on top of PyQt for its GUI and uh, using VizPy um, for sort of highly performant. Um, uh, GPU-based rendering, and uh, sort of designed to integrate well with the scientific Python um, stack, so things like NumPy, um, SciPy, and uh, we sort of can support loading um, task arrays, R arrays, things like that. Um, we're in a sort of alpha stage, so it's, it's pretty early, but uh, um, you can um, pip install us at, with Napari, or you can check us out uh, on GitHub at Napari slash Napari. Um, the core team, um, some of us are here, uh, Kira Evans, a, a software engineer, uh, Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, which is where I work. Um, uh, Juan is a Psyche image uh, maintainer who's here too. And uh, let me sort of switch to a, a live demo. So um, here we're looking at um, uh, an image, um, and it's interestingly interacting weirdly with my screen because of the great. Anyway. Um, so you can see we've got sort of different layers um, on the side. We can sort of go in and just uh, things like uh, color maps. Um, uh, we can have uh, time series data. This is actually images of neurons kind of blinking on and off. Um, if you had more uh, like four-dimensional, five-dimensional uh, data, you'd get more sliders. Um, I can show sort of another example. This is a kind of a 2D pathology image. It's about 100,000 by 200,000 pixels, so it would be very hard for a pathologist to kind of load into memory. It doesn't fit. Um, we're leveraging ZAR uh, and a kind of um, image pyramid. Um, so again, it's kind of zooming is a bit weird, but I can sort of zoom in. I can then... Um, pan around, things like that. Uh, I can zoom even more in. Um, and um, um, yeah, so you know, big, big data sets like that. Um, let me sort of show, we have kind of bi-directional um, integration with um, uh, notebooks. So I can kind of launch from a notebook. I get sort of an empty viewer. There's nothing there. I can start adding things um, from the uh, notebook. Now I have an image there. I can sort of see it's over here. I can see that data. I could come in here, I could sort of add um, some points, put them over here, I could kind of come back now, um, I've got that data over here. Um, we have um, shapes, so uh, things that you might find in a tool like Illustrator. Um, but again, it's sort of really designed for a more scientific use case. Um, and so um, that you know, means that uh, it's very easy to get this data into things like NumPy arrays, uh, stuff like that. Um, another, oops. Uh, um, another sort of type of layer that we have um, is more like a um, sort of paintbrush where I can sort of come in here and I can and paint and stuff. So if you're interested, um, check us out. We'll be at the uh, sprints. Um, and um, yeah, feel free to, to sort of come find us. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you, Nick. Well, whenever I want more sliders, I just go to White Castle. I don't know about you. but. Um, <laughs> Now we have Kim on deck, or up, and uh, next up on deck is David Nicholson. Yep, all right, perfect. All right, so we know that data science is blue, and look, at, look, we're doing data science. <laughs> <laughs> wow, there's so much data science on the screen so right much, now. We've been doing it all along. It's, it's impressive how much. Before we even had a name for it, we were doing it. <laughs> all right. Maybe. Take it away. Oh, or not. Or not. Oh, there we <laughs> oh. go. Okay. So uh, my name is Kim Peavy. 
And uh, I am a hydraulic research engineer for the Corps of Engineers at the Engineer Research and Development Center. So I started my, my career as a numerical model, specifically in hydraulics, and I kind of turned into a programmer at some point along the way. Um, but as, an, as a numerical modeler, one of the things we had to do was to go out to the web, find some aerial imagery, and digitize the coastline. And that took maddening amount of work and um, basically took weeks to months. And so uh, what I've done here is well, my team. I, I had very little to do with it, actually. But um, uh, what we've done is reduce that time down to less than five minutes, three minutes, two and a half. Uh, <laughs> so instead of weeks and months, I'm going to do a live demo in two minutes. OK, so uh, through the help of all of my uh, contributing packages, open, all completely open source, specifically panel pipeline, we take this little bit of code, and um, so we have different pages that, of our panel pipeline. So we zoom in using a web map tile service, uh, and we have a drop down so we can use whatever one we like. We select a region. So um, we have several different series here. I mean, I'm going really quick here. OK, so um, and then. So what we're using Quest goes out, reaches out to the web map tile service, so I don't have to go and find this aerial imagery. It brings it down. I denote what's land, what's water, and uh, using OpenCV grab cuts, it gives me uh, image delineation. And then I can reduce that down and click Next. And then I can use the annotators, which are in EarthSim, to actually modify these polygons if I'd like to. Uh, I would. Modify the vertices, not the actual, don't move the polygon. Um, and then on the next page, uh, we can set some node spacing here. And, oh, that's, this is the path editor. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I'm going to jump here to this guy. And set some node spacing. And then I have uh, a mesher, which automatically updates my mesh, which you can't see, so I'm going to switch the web map tile service that sits behind it. And I have just done weeks worth of work in a matter of two minutes. Um, and then this, oh, also the mesher is using Aquaveo's XMS mesh, too. So it's using all these different open source packages and reducing a whole lot of work down into a very short period of time. That's it. Thank you so much. So that, that was an excellent pipeline, but uh, with a little bit of linear algebra, do you think we could extend it to a pipe plane? <laughs> well, I was going to say. You get my point? Yeah. I feel like we're not meshing very well up here. Um, set up, set up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, come on, come on up here. No time to They're, waste. Before they hang me. <laughs> um, uh, up next on deck, we have Jim Christ. Yeah. And I, I have to say, like, there were no ghosts in that talk, but it was sure eerie. <laughs> and uh, I've, two talks in a row now, we've had some zooming and panning. I just want the enhance. Can we add the enhance functionality? Get off stage. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and are we, uh, while we're nope. waiting, anyone? Oh. oh you... No, no. It, it's so blank. much data science. It's blank. Just, well, no, it's, it's blank. Oh, there, okay. we go. there we go. Perfect. Um, hi, my name is Ivan. Uh, I'm working at OneSight. Uh, I'm also uh, a member of the SciPy Latin America community. Well, today I will talk about IBIS, uh, uh, specifically about uh, the last uh, blog post we wrote uh, at the Quensai Labs blog. So just a question, uh, who knows about IBIS framework? Good hand, up your hand? Ah, a little bit. OK, but nice. Well, um, IBIS like, uh, has like the Pandas API. It helps to, uh, who knows uh, SQL uh, a lot, uh, yeah. But uh, um, it helps uh, um, people, for example, do not know uh, SQL. It uh, has the uh, Pandas API. 
so people can create expressions and when to want to get data from the database uh, just need to uh, to run the execute uh, command and need to get the data using the uh, and out, the output will be like a pandas data frame uh, for example here uh, who knows uh, omnicide DB uh, nice uh, for example, uh, in this blog post, we are using the OmniSide DB. Uh, for uh, OmniSide DB, also uh, you can work with uh, pandas as output, or if you are using GPU, could uh, you can use uh, QDF. So, uh, if you want to use IBIS to and OmniSide DB to get uh, in work with GPU, you can use it. Uh, now we are working to have more geospatial features. Uh, so, for example, uh, you could uh, use uh, um, uh, work with output as a uh, geo data frame and plot uh, easily uh, geo data, geospatial data. And well, in this blog post, we also uh, we are talking about the geospatial features, uh, also some trigonometric operations, and statistical operations also. And, uh, why should I use IBIS? So basically here we are talking about three things. If you get data from SQL database, if you uh, create a statement manually, and it's very hard to maintain, and if you want to uh, work with big data. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ivan. <laughs> Next up on deck, we have uh, Dylan. Come up. Yep. And uh, yeah. Do you have a joke, Paul? No. No? Okay. Well, I mean, I think IBIS is peerless. It, it truly has no sequel. Oh. oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I get it. Yeah, sorry. Because I, I see what you did there. Yeah. <laughs> I, I could say an IBIS pun, but I might egret it. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm wishing for the days of the owl. Like, so, the owl should come back now. Yeah. Let's not make any foul puns either. <laughs> no? That's quackery? No? <laughs> <laughs> I would never, Gil. Yeah, I got plenty of bird jokes. I don't want to steal your punder. Uh, uh, oh, but it's uh, punder dome. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Only one can. Right. There's three of us, Paul. It, it's not how this game works. <laughs> mm, my laptop doesn't want to work. Um, so I have a challenge while I try to figure this out. Anyone do musically talented in the audience? Any, any do any music? Oh, of course, all of you are scared of me now. Yay, music, all right. So uh, as we've now found out from the keynote that we, data science is blue, I think we should have like a data science blues song that someone writes. You know, like I got no data, yeah. got no data frames. Uh, we can try to reschedule no? you. Yeah. I'm glad you're coming with me on this one. So that's something for tomorrow. I, I will, for, I was there for if, you, if you want it, it's yours. You know, just run with it. We expect a lightning talk blues song by Friday from all of you. That's your homework. Um, yeah. Okay, so I think we're gonna try to get back to David sure. uh, at a later time. Right. So, um, Jim, I believe if you can come up, and then we'll add another person uh, to the end. Andre, are you? I've seen you around. Yep, there you are. All right, perfect. Uh, where is the thing? In the meantime, Anthony, we still have plenty of time to fill. It's true, but hopefully. This just works, and it looks like it does. 350 first-time SciPy attendees. Amazing. Woo! Woo! Cool. That's that. It's up. All there set. Yeah. Wonderful. All right, uh, so I'm going to quick talk about Dask Gateway. Um, for those that are not familiar with Dask, uh, Dask is a project for parallelizing and distributing Python computing. Um, if you're familiar with Spark, you can think it's like Spark, but hopefully uh, friendly and flexible uh, and written in Python. Um, so 
DAS deployment options. Currently, uh, we support a couple different deployments uh, natively. We can run on Kubernetes, we can run on Yarn, we can run on HPC clusters. All of these have a Python API. You create objects behind the scenes, they spin up whatever resources. Resources are managed inside your Python script or inside your Jupyter Notebook. Um, this seems to work really great. It's really flexible. Um, this has been useful for getting people up and running. Um, most people seem pretty happy with this. Uh, but there are a couple of feature requests that larger institutions have asked for that these options really can't support. Um, a few things we could patch on, but a, a lot of this is pointing towards needing an extra tool. Um, DAS Gateway is hopefully that tool. Uh, so a few common requests. People want some kind of central management. Uh, if you have people that are uh, users, lots of users that are using some kind of shared resources, you'd like some way to essentially figure out what's going on, see what users are using too much of your cluster, uh, apply resource limits. Um, you'd like to restrict user permissions. A lot of the current DAS deployment options uh, require the users to have access to uh, spin up jobs on your cluster. Um, that might not be tenable, uh, depending on your backend. Um, Requires network access. Your client uh, has to be accessible to the scheduler. That requires you to SSH in sometimes. It's not necessarily the easiest user experience for some cases. Uh, for other people, it's great, and it works fine. Uh, because our clusters are managed by Python objects, this means that you have uh, your cluster lasts as long as your Python script or notebook. If you restart your notebook, you lose your cluster and have to start all over. It'd be nice if that was managed externally. Um, and then we'd also like to have uh, security on uh, by default. Um, Dask does support TLS, so you have to manage it yourself. Um, institutions and companies often want this on. Uh, so Dask Gateway uh, hopefully tries to solve all these issues. Uh, it's like JupyterHub, but for Dask. Um, we cribbed a lot of stuff from JupyterHub. Uh, that project is great. You all are great. Uh, architecture. Um, Quick, we have our happy users over here. We have our box that's our cluster here. This could be a Hadoop cluster, this could be a Kubernetes, this could be an HPC job system. Various different things. Uh, users connect uh, over a single port. Uh, they can create a cluster. Uh, they can connect to an existing cluster. They can shut down clusters, see what's running. Um, so that means that your client uh, and your notebook and whatever other you know, front end you want to be using is local on your laptop or on your workstation, and you have access to some hardware behind a secure firewall. Um, Features, centrally managed, admin spins everything up themselves, uh, secure by default, uh, it's flexible, so we support all of the backends that Dask natively supports, except in the gateway, and it's robust to failure. Uh, docs, we mostly don't have them. Um, <laughs> there is a doc page right here. Uh, you can go to it. Uh, it's mostly a front page and API. Um, I will be here for the rest of the conference. If this sounds useful to you, please come find me. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Please. Um, up next, after Andre, we'll have uh, Chris Barker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Desk not what you can do for your cluster. But <laughs> <laughs> what your cluster. You can't even make it through this one. <laughs> one. <laughs> I, I had nothing. That was impossible to pun on, so. Uh, but it looks like our next speaker is ready to go, so All give right. it up for uh, Dylan. All right, thank you everyone. Uh, my name is Dylan, my pronouns are he, him. I work for a company called Novi here in Austin, uh, and I'm here today to talk to you about what you can do to understand a monster that you've created. So the year is 2017, uh, I am Scott Cole. Um, I'm trying to find the tastiest burrito in San Diego, and I compile this data set of 400 different burrito places, uh, how much the burritos cost, uh, what is in them, um, and how tasty they are. And let's say that my initial attempt here is building a linear model, a linear regression to predict how tasty burritos are uh, based on these features. Now, linear models are nice in that if I want to know where any particular burrito prediction comes from, I can take these coefficients and say, okay, does it have onion in it? I'm going to subtract 1.4 whatever tasty points from my thing. Um, but this is clearly incorrect. Like, you cannot take the worst burrito in the world, add egg to it, and all of a sudden it is an average burrito. If we want to model complex things that exist in the world, we need complex models to do this. So if we use something like a random forest instead, what we see is we get something much more realistic. The important things here are, is the meat good? Um, are the ingredients distributed evenly throughout the burrito? Um, but this is a model that's no longer legible. So I cannot look at the actual numbers inside of here, and these are the feature importances, and reconstruct where our prediction comes from. So a solution to this is we can take our complex model and we can train a linear model to predict the behavior of the nonlinear one. 
Um, now it turns out there was this economist, a guy named Lloyd Shapley, who has proved that this formula you see on the slide is the most accurate way to do this, to create a linear model that summarizes a much more complex one. And I can explain this to you later, probably not in my three minutes. So what we can use this for is we can generate um, the linear contribution of every single feature to every single prediction in our model. And this can tell us about our models if we plot all of those in a summary plot you see here. We call these affectionately tornado plots. Uh, we can see that meat here at the top covaries the strongest uh, with the burrito quality, and that relationship is very, very linear. You can tell this from the color. So the tasty meats are red, the really bad meats are blue, bad meats mean my burrito is very, very low quality. Now, what this gives us in addition is for any particular prediction, I can tell you why my model is saying what it's saying. Why does it say this burrito is just a little bit better than average? It has good meat, it has good salsa, uh, but in this case, the burrito is non-uniform. So you take that first bite and it's like just sour cream. Now, what this means for you, if you're a burrito shop proprietor and I have your data and this is your burrito right here, is this gives you immediately actionable knowledge about what you can do to fix your burritos so they become more tasty. Now, if we look back at, and we totally glossed over this, uh, but the formula here, there's a term in here um, that is factorial, you see two exclamation points, factorial in its complexity, in the number of features, and that makes this usually intractable to calculate. Um, a couple of clever people uh, at UW have figured out for some models, you can do this in time that is uh, quadratic to the depth of the trees you're predicting. Um, this, in this model here uh, by Scott Lundberg, it's called SHAP. Uh, I highly recommend you check it out, thank you. All right. Setting trends at SciPy. You heard it here first. Deep learning may not have started at SciPy, but deep eating has. You know what? Um, this cable. That, that was all I had, Anthony. Thank you. Do you, do you want to do you want to help us bring fill, the next person? Fill fill the burrito as a. Oh, oh yeah, sorry. I, yeah, sorry. The next person up is uh, Steve Sylvester. Um, pew, 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 pew. Cricket. Ah, there we are. Um, okay. All right. Are you? Is there a computer working, Andre? Oh, well, I don't know. Looks like it is, right? It looks like it, it is. looks like, yeah. All right. Oh, well, we're, me, we're no longer in data science land. Let me mirror the screen. This truly is the year of the Linux desktop. I just. <laughs> want to say makes that. makes that joke every year. He's I know, it it's so years, funny though. And it's, it's still funny. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Wait. Oh, yeah, oh, with, with WSL. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. All right. Is it visible? Andre. Oh, yeah, there we are. There you go. There All right. Go. All right. Thank Take you. it away. Thank you. So I'd like to share with you some uh, work that we've been doing on, a, on an interactive Fortran compiler called L Fortran. Uh, how many of you use Python? All of you. <laughs> How many of you use Fortran? A lot of you. So uh, when you have, we have production codes, I work at Los Alamos, a lot of them are in Fortran or C++. And then when I'm developing a new feature, um, I typically um, you know, like to do it in Python. And I develop some algorithm, and then I like to put it in the production code, So which means I have to painstakingly translate Python to Fortran, for example. Well, it'd be nice if I could start in Fortran and develop interactively in Jupyter Notebooks and plottings and everything. And um, so I decided to, uh, to write a compiler to do that. So while, of course, Binder takes a long time to, to load where I need it the most, so we'll uh, uh, launch it from, um, uh, from a terminal. So here is a, a demo. Um, this is a Jupyter Notebook, and it's running an interactive uh, Fortran kernel using L Fortran as the backend. So what you see there is regular modern Fortran. So you have to declare variables. You can declare functions. Um, you can call functions. Yeah. Is it better? Enhance. Uh, so yeah, so you can see I'm declaring a variable here, then I can use it. I can declare a function. I can call a function. I can redeclare a function. Just like in Python, now it's doing something else. I can do, you know, for loops. I can print some variable. I can do some plotting. So far, this is just a prototype plotting. But, um, and, um, and then I can also have some Python, or I guess Fortran magics to show the AST. So you can see what the AST is for the for loop and uh, LVM that this generates and also assembly code. Um, 
people usually ask uh, what happens if I assign a string to an integer here. So, so first of all, let's reevaluate it, and then let's create a new cell, and let's assign some, um, you know, some string into it. So you get a you get an error because it's for turn. The error message can be improved, and it will be improved, but it works. So. Uh, I have 30 seconds le uh, left, so I'll just show you some of the, the our plans that we want to do with this. Uh, once this is ready, we want people to be able to use Jupyter Notebook to develop things, and also, for example, to use SymPy to target this L Fortran compiler to generate Fortran code or LLVM code, or to, com to convert Fortran code to uh, SymPy, or to parse F77 code and use L Fortran to modernize it, to, to, to print out modern Fortran code, and many, many other uses. Thank you. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Chris. Fortran, that, that takes me back. That's Fortran magic. For, Fortran is magic. Yeah, yeah, Fortran is magic. It translates your formulas. I, but I, I'm really happy at speaking French now. <laughs> Le Fortran. <laughs> oh, oh. It's L Fortran. It's Spanish. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. I expected another character there. Yeah. Uh, Chris, are you ready to go here? Am I? You look, you look at. I yeah. can't see the Looking screen, great. so you got to tell me. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, we, we, we can put uh, Angela on deck, and maybe we will get to you today, and maybe we won't, so, but hopefully we will. All right, and so uh, my name is Chris Barker, and I just realized this is my 10th SciPy, so I figured it was about time to do a lightning talk. <laughs> um, so one thing I've noticed on a lot of the mailing lists is that newbies come to Python, and scientists and engineers are trying to use Python to solve their problems. And they've got this little collection of their own little functions, their utilities, and helpful for them. Um, and so the question they often ask is, where do I put that code so I can use it? Um, and the answer to that is make a Python package out of it. Uh, <clears throat> but what comes up is people, their first thing to think is, well, I'm just going to have a copy of my code, and I'm going to copy and paste the functions I need into each new project. So don't do that, really, really don't do that. Um, the other thing people think to do is to put all their code in one directory and then add it to the Python path, and all problems are solved. And don't do that either. Um, so what you want to do is make a package. And the problem is when you tell people this, they go and they look up Python packaging, and there's all this great documentation out there. Um, but that documentation is very much oriented towards building up your package that you're going to put on PyPy and distribute to the world and have multiple developers working on and people contributing. And there's all this infrastructure around it that supports that. And people go, well, I don't want to do all that. And I don't need all that. So they go back and start copying and pasting their code around again. Uh, the other thing people sometimes do is sit down and start following all those instructions. And then they end up sticking their not very useful to anybody else package up on PyPy, which is also not a great idea. Um, so what I'm advocating is that you can make a really simple package just for yourself. And you use that just as a way to share code among your own projects on your own computer. And this is really easy to do. All you actually need is a little directory tree that looks like this, where you've got your code. And inside that, there's a directory uh, with your package name in it. You put init.py in there. And then you need a little setup.py to make it work. And again, you go and look at the packaging documentation. And setup.py has requirements and metadata and all this mess. And that's all you need. <laughs> so if you're just trying to make a package you're going to use for yourself, that's all you need. And now to make it even easier, I made a little script that builds this little structure for you. And do I have time to do a live demo? Oh, OK. So if I do Python make package, test package. Um, I now have just created my little test package. I'll cd into there, and if I do pip install minus e to make it editable, that way you can change your code in place and you have to go and reinstall the package everywhere. This directory, and now it's installed. And I can import it. And there it is. And I can also do a, here, let's find, I had my example code here. Yes, from test package. Uh, import test code. 
<laughs> and now your test code has a little test function in it, and if you call that function, it works. Amazing. Wow. In the nick of time. Truly. In the, in the, truly in the nick of time. Truly amazing. Python packaging is such... It's been a problem for a long time. It's gotten a lot better. You know, uh, when when I was at UC Berkeley and the the IPython before Jupiter, right? The IPython development team. When we got to lunch, we had an index that uh, just invariably every conversation would somehow going end up going to Python packaging. So we had time to Python packaging was like a number for every conversation, and it was always non-zero, and it was always not infinity, right? There's always is all there, problems. Is there a joke here, or no, is it no. just I was, a what, 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 what I was really wanted, what, what, my roundabout way right, of getting right. there. Ever, ever <laughs> since we got wheels, it's really been rolling along. Oh, man. Which one of these slides show? They're cheese wheels. All right, this isn't working. Oh it, looks, oh, it looks right on your end. OK, sorry, I was looking at the different thing. All right, the title of this talk is Let's Do This Together, Diversity, Inclusion, and Mental Wellness. I'm Steve Sylvester, I work at JP Morgan Chase, and I'm on Project Jupiter, but I'm here representing myself. Let's talk about identity. American, male, white, cisgendered, heterosexual, libertarian, agnostic Christian, able-bodied, veteran, anxiety, and depression. Each of these things describes one dimension of me, but even taken in aggregate, you won't know me if these labels are all you know. I had a boss tell me, you are the white man on the team, and I laughed, but then I thought about his strategy. He specifically was looking to add diversity to his team along multiple dimensions. As humans, we tend to be tribal, finding ways to bond around commonality and exclude others along some arbitrary lines. We also tend to bond with people that we see every day and find new points of commonality. Spending time together is a cure for bias and prejudice. Through open source, school, and employment, I have met people from all around the world that differ from me on every single one of these aspects, and I have been better for it. I recognize that many of the things in this list put me in a historically privileged position. I challenge everyone, including myself, to recognize bias and prejudice and seek to stamp it out wherever you see it. Use the Pac-Man rule. Leave a hole in your group for someone to come up and join and talk to you. Ask to sit at a table with someone you've never met before. If you find something unique about someone, ask them about it and listen with the intent of understanding. If you are in a position to hire or refer someone, don't just look to your friend pool. Seek out or help create events like the Diversity and Inclusion in Scientific Computing Conference. One other topic, mental wellness. I use this in jest. I hid the fact that I had anxiety and depression for almost 20 years, and all it did was make it worse. Let's stop ignoring and stigmatizing mental illness and encourage each other to get treatment. I was stubborn about seeing and staying with counselors and therapists, thinking I can do this on my own. When the problem is literally in your own head, you really can't. I've tried many things, and they've all helped some. Tools in my toolbox include forest walks, yoga, group exercise, and progressive muscle relaxation. One of my counselors likened my thoughts to a broken record player. The things that work for me are the ones that stop the record from skipping. By far the most effective method has been talking. So if you are suffering, talk about it. Start talking to yourself if you have to, and then work your way outwards. If you see someone suffering, ask how they're doing, and keep asking. I can be stubborn about accepting help, but the people that wouldn't let me go down my own spiral are why I'm able to stand up here today. So lend a hand up, and let's do this together. Thank you so much for that, Steve. That was great. Very powerful. I think this will be the last talk of the lightning talks today, this session. So, yeah. Then we'll close out. And what, what happened? Is it the beer garden after this? 
Oh, it's poster session. Posters, thanks, yeah. Um, and you don't have to go very far, so that's awesome. You're in the right place. Yeah. I mean, you can still get lost if you want to, but. All right. All right. There we are. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so I just want to demonstrate to you how we have put all the tools that we've been talking about the conference together and build this gigantic mouse aging cell atlas. And um, just a quick overview, by using uh, Python and all the packages on, on that are on the scientific Python, we have been able to manage about five, um, half a million cells across 20 tissues, across six different ages of the mouse. We annotate the data set by using classification methods if we have a reference and then we can just map to the labels that already exist with all the functions that are available. We have improved to the entire community an annotated data set of half a million cells that is publicly available and everyone can use. And we leveraging on tools that were presented here last year like the UMAP, we can cluster all the data together and now we can, for example, ask different cell types that are shared by different organs, are they all coming together and how can we start um, assessing these? For example, at the level of cellular senescence, so cells that are the trigger for bad behavior on your body, can we then use plots in Seaborn, for example, to assess the changes with age? What about the mutation load? Does it increase with age across all the different tissues? And now, what about your immune changes? Oh, this looks really interesting when we can plot this is in a network tool and we can see that the B cells and the T cell clones are really increasing with age, so the diversity is massively reducing. And um, this is just a big thanks to all the people that have developed. So we've leveraged on all these uh, libraries, especially ScanPy and Cell by Gene. Um, and I just want to exit here and just do a live demo very quick of where you can get our data. So we have a website that is open. So you can click in any of these tissues and this takes you to a cell by gene browser. And here you can start um, looking at the different cell types that are there. So, okay, let's say I want to look into the aortic cells so I can go here, okay, this, uh, this is where my aortic cells are. I can zoom and I can see from which mouse did these cells come from. Oh, it's actually a single mouse. What is the sex of the mouse? It's male. And so we can just kind of like keep asking all these questions so the entire community can just kind of like use all the data that we have made available here to ask all the questions that they have. And thank you. Thank you, thank and you so much. much. Well, I know nothing about mice, but I think that put a rodent in my knowledge. <laughs> right at the tail end of that curve Did there. Did you see there was, there, was some, there was some bar charts and there, there was a violin plot, so it was very nice. I think they were missing some whiskers. <sighs> and with that, this closes out the first session of Lightning Talks of 20, Sci-Fi 2019. So, thank you so much. Uh, we are doing this again tomorrow. We are doing this again Friday. And now, if you're one of the 350 people that this was your first time here, you're like, well, how do I do this? Because we, there's 40 slots. We only went through 13 people today. How are we going to get through all this? So we have a solution, which is that we're going to have a separate list for first-time attendees that we're going to interleave. So if this is your first SciPy and you would like to give a lightning talk, we can try to get you on. So come see us afterwards or tomorrow or the day after, and uh, we'll, we'll try to get you on because we want to be inclusive and we want everyone uh, to get a chance to be up here and not just and us. participate. Yeah. Participate, yeah. yeah. So thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the poster session.